This is the lecture for Monday, April 13th. We will continue our discussion of the quark gluon plasma. Today we will focus on flow of the heavy ion collision. Then that may sound a bit odd to talk about flow since we know there's just a whole bunch of particles coming out of this collision. But it turns out that the quark gluon plasma that's formed in the early stages of the collision actually behaves more or less like a liquid. So it, it flows like a, a liquid, and so we can apply hydrodynamics. In fact, it will turn out that this liquid will have a low viscosity. So viscosity, we'll talk about more in a, a bit later, will be the resistance to the, the differential flow of a liquid, the, the, the different speeds of the, of the motion of the liquid. Okay, so let's first start off with a very simple model, sort of the independent particle-particle collision model. All right, here we see uh, the, we have, imagine we have one nucleus going this way, so the beam axis is, is, is perpendicular to the page. So we have one nucleus going this way, and the other nucleus going in the op opposite direction. So there's a collision like this, there's a collision. And there'll be something called the impact parameter, which is the, the separation between the centers of the two nuclei. And so if the impact parameter is not zero, if they're not completely overlapping, then you'll notice that the, the region where they collide will have this sort of almond shape to it. We'll call this, if you, if you, don't, if you neglect the little cusps here, then this looks sort of like an ellipse. And so we'll talk about the elliptical shape of the overlap region. Now, if we have an independent particle-particle model of how this, how, the, how this heavy ion collision works, then we have a whole bunch of nucleon, nucleons colliding. And each nucleon collision, nucleonic collision, will have some uh, random distribution of particles flying out. So on average, you would see, expect to see some isotropic um, distribution of particles coming from each collision. Now, if all of these collisions are independent of each other and things are not getting in the way and they're not talking to each other, then you can imagine when you s look at the heavy ion collision, you see then just a bunch of these independent particle-particle collisions um, added up together and you'll get something isotropic. Now, on the other end, though, you may think that the particles, uh, these collisions that you see will interfere with each other, they will not just pass through each other since they occupy some space and they interact. And so instead they behave like some, some bulk system, like a, a liquid. Now, what's interesting about a liquid is that, think about maybe a water balloon or, or some, some balloon that, that uh, has this uh, elongated shape where it's, it's compressed in one direction and elongated in the, in the other. So there'll be some differential in the pressures in that there's more compression in this direction. And so if you were to release this from, from this state, you would actually see that there's more of a pushback in this direction than in this direction. So now as a result, you'll find that it no longer has this elliptical shape to it, but that you have this more, there's more flowing out along the reaction plane, okay? So that's what we expect to see in this particular case. So just to get your, your bearings uh, once again, here is the reaction plane. So that's the, uh, you, you, so here's the beam axis that's perpendicular to the paper right now. That's the beam axis. One particle is going this way, the other one's coming up the other direction. The reaction plane is then just the plane that's perpendicular, to, uh, sorry, th th that goes through the, uh, the centers of the particles, okay? And now um, we'll be measuring um, something called the azimuthal angle. Um, that, will be perp that will be measured uh, like this, perpendicular to the, to the beam axis, but starting from phi equals to zero. So the azimuthal angle will be, will be called phi. And phi equals to zero corresponds with the reaction plane. And phi equals to 90 degrees will correspond with the uh, Will, will correspond with um, the uh, perpendicular to the reaction plane. Okay, so now um, here is what you expect to see if we have this 
hydrodynamic model of a fluid, we would expect to see more uh, fast particles or more particles in general streaming out um, along the, the reaction plane where phi equals to zero and fewer stuff, fewer things coming along phi equals to 90 degrees or phi is equal to pi over 2. So if we are to plot this out, these um, azimuthal angle distribution, for the independent particle-particle uh, model, then everything will be isotropic. And then the distribution of, of, of the multiplicity you would see would be flat. It would be independent of phi measured with, with respect to the reaction plane. Uh, now, if I d have a hydrodynamic system acting like a bulk material, then uh, like a liquid, then I would expect to see a maximum um, along the reaction plane, phi equals to zero. And then I would have a minimum at phi is equal to, to 90, uh, or pi over 2, and then uh, back up to, to a maximum uh, uh, when I'm looking over here in this direction, again at phi equals to pi, or uh, 180 degrees. And that's more or less what we see. We see this elliptic flow pattern, OK? So um, the <coughs> b, remember, is the impact parameter. So if b is equal to 0, or if b is rather small, then the nuclei are colliding sort of head on, and there is no ellipticity to it. And so we would expect then um, not to have this very pronounced uh, uh, maximum, minimum, maximum behavior, okay? But if B, the impact parameter, is bigger, um, then we would have a more, th uh, a more uh, uh, elliptical shape. Then we have a glancing collision, and so this, this little, this almond will be very narrow, and so we would then see, expect to see then more of this pattern here, uh, this, um, this elliptic flow. Now, we can write this azimuthal dependence as some constant plus two times some coefficient that we call v2 times the cosine of two times phi. So this has that pattern where there's a maximum at phi equals to zero, a minimum at phi is equal to 90, or, or pi over two radians, and then a maximum again at 180, or pi, the phi is equal to pi radians. And so this v2 will depend on the amount of energy or the amount of transverse momentum in this, um, in this collision. So PT is the transverse momentum. All right, so now we can take a look at what the data uh, shows here for various different uh, uh, um, data at RIC, at the Brookhaven uh, Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. And so you see data for pi plus pi minus. Um, uh, that those are these, these dots here at 200 GeV. Then you see data for K0 short. Um, and then you see data for p proton, antiproton, for lambda, uh, anti-lambda, and you see data for cascades. All right, so there's some mass dependence going on. We'll talk about that in a moment. But we see something that's, that's consistent with elliptic flow, the fact that we see this V2, a non-zero V2. Um, I'll talk a little bit about viscosity in a moment. Now, here's more, more data. This, though, is at much higher uh, energies. This is from Alice, and so that's at the, the Large Hadron Collider. So again, we're, we're showing the V2, and we see a little bit of curvature here. And so here, in this case, in order to get this behavior, um, you, you need to introduce some viscosity. We'll, we'll talk about that in, in a moment. Now, so there's this, you saw data for different things, for pi plus pi minus, for k plus k minus, all right, K0 star, uh, K, uh, K0, okay, um, and, and uh, the, the, the pi, oh, the, sorry, the, the proton, anti-proton, lambda, anti-lambda, and cascade, anti-cascade, okay? But we can actually collapse these, these curves onto each other if we um, write V2 divided by the number of quarks or anti-quarks um, in, the, in the simplest description of what these pions, there are two quarks, or two quark or anti-quark, uh, but the protons, the lambdas, and the cascades have three quarks, okay? So if you divide V2 by the number of quarks and divide the kinetic energy, 
by the number of quarks again, you see that the curves just miraculously fold on top of each other like this. That suggests that things are flowing at the quark level, um, and then there's just some hadronization that happens later, but all of this flow is happening um, at the quark level in the quark gluon plasma. All right? So that's uh, strongly suggestive that we have this, this hydrodynamic quark, quark flow. All right, so now we can um, then, then plot out this V2, okay, as a function of the energy. And what you see is you see for um, when you have sufficient amount of energy, you see this elliptic flow happening. So you can see also the, um, what's going on with, uh, so, so the data over here is from the LHC, this is the data over here is from the Rick heavy ion uh, collider. So, sorry, the relativistic heavy ion collider. Now, we can make a connection to some theory here. So to explain this, though, I, I need to give you some background of what's going on um, with, with that. So we'll have to talk a little bit about what, is, what exactly is viscosity. So um, viscosity is, so you think of, when you think of viscosity, think of like um, maple syrup, OK? Suppose I have a plate here, let's say horizontal plate, and another plate over here, let's say with an area A. And let's say, um, so let's say I have some liquid flowing in between this, in, in this region between the two plates, okay? So let me just draw it in, in a two-dimensional side view of, of, this, of this rectangle so it doesn't look quite so three-dimensional here. And let's say that on the bottom plate that the fluid has no velocity, it's, it's stationary, okay? But but what happens is there's a differential flow. There is um, a bigger and bigger flow as I get further and further away from that stationary plate. Okay, so let's say at the top we have a velocity of u, and then at the bottom there's a velocity of zero, and let's say y is the height or the spacing between the two uh, ends, the, 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 the distance here, the vertical height. Then um, the notion of, of the Viscosity, the definition of viscosity here, the shear viscosity, is going to be, there's going to be some force that's needed, um, that there's some resistive force, it's, it's resisting the motion, that will be proportional to the area of, the, of this, regi of, of this region, um, times the top velocity, which is u and zero on the bottom, but it will also be inversely proportional to the, the separation, so the uh, the smaller y is, the more difficult it is to achieve this differential flow because the, the velocity has to change very abruptly um, over, uh, over this distance. Now, there's a proportionality, pr constant proportionality, which is called the viscosity. That's the viscosity. Okay, so that's the viscosity. Now, um, you can also talk about the viscosity for a dilute gas. And so for a dilute gas, you can uh, write down the viscosity of a dilute gas um, in terms of um, some formula. But it, it's, it's n let's not get too detailed, but it's proportional to the density, uh, s sorry, it's proportional to the density of particles, okay, times the average momentum, times the, uh, the what's called the mean free path. Right. And the the idea that there's um, that there is this uh, momentum and there is this uh, length scale um, was suggestive to some people when they thought about in a quantum system how low can the viscosity actually go can it really be zero can you have a sort of a fluid that has zero viscosity or is that violating some notion of quantum mechanics and because this was reminiscent of, mom of momentum times the distance, p times x. So you, mem you probably remember some uncertainty principle that this is bounded by um, h bar over 2, this product. And so similarly, there was a thought that the viscosity, the quant when you work at the quantum level, that there's a limit to how much the viscosity could be. Okay? And so there was this paper, now a very famous paper, um, by Kovtun, Son, and Starnitz, from 2005 that said that if I take the viscosity 
okay? And divide by the uh, something that looks like a density to get rid of the, this thing as a particle density. So d divide by something called S. So S is going to be what's called the entropy density. All right? Um, and they made a conjecture that this is actually bounded below. They said that, um, I'll come back to what entropy density is in just a moment if, if that's if that's not uh, on the tip of your tongue right now. Um, so A over S, they said, was perhaps bounded above by um, 1 over 4 pi, that it could not be uh, less than 1 over 4 pi. Now, I'm, I'm uh, taking units where K Boltzmann is, I'm taking units where the Boltzmann factor is, is, um, is K Boltzmann is, Boltzmann's constant is equal to 1. Um, so this entropy density, so w what exactly is entropy? Well, entropy, capital S, is the is K Boltzmann times the log of the number of quantum states. Um, so the entropy density is just um, how much entropy you have per, per unit volume. And so th the idea is that eta over S, then um, in units where uh, K Boltzmann is equal to 1, cannot be uh, less than 1 over 4 pi. Now, how did they come up with that bound? Well, there was a calculation, um, a, a rather interesting calculation that would, was actually done by, by, by others at the time, but, but uh, uh, what was found was, well, okay, I should tell you, what they did was they did a calculation of a, of a supersymmetric, supersymmetric, so supersymmetric, SUSY is, is the abbreviation for supersymmetric um, theory, uh, it was a Yang Mills theory, okay? Uh, Yang Mills theories we, we've discussed before. Yang Mills. That's just a non That's a gauge theory. Like remember we talked about SU three gauge theory for the quantum chromodynamics. Yang Mills is discussion of any gauge theory where the gr gauge group is not uh, a commutative group. It's not U one, but it's something like SU three. So anyways, they studied a particular supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory. Supersymmetric, I, I realize I didn't tell you what that meant. Supersymmetric says that for every fermion, there is a boson. And for every boson, there is a fermion, so that you have a symmetry between fermions and bosons. And it ends up canceling a, a, out some, some nasty things in, in a quantum field theory. And it makes it so that you can, in some cases, when there's enough symmetry, that you can write down exact solutions of various observables. And that's what they did. They used a particular kind of, of uh, supersymmetric theory, some, something that's called n equals 4 supersymmetry, where there's a lots, lots of uh, various constraints in that theory. Um, and they were able to uh, make predictions of the properties of the system, even though it was a strongly coupled theory, um, a, a complicated theory. Um, now, Anyways, so th they, they were able to make a connection. There, there's more to the story, believe it or not, that, um, that the supersymmetric theory, the strongly coupled supersymmetric theory, it is actually what's called dual to a weakly coupled gravity theory, classical gravity. Classical gravity. Okay. All right, so in other words, you can... These two theories describe the same physics, um, except the classical gravity theory actually lives in one extra dimension, uh, which we won't go into the details of that. But anyways, you can do calculations on this side that gives you the exact answer for this guy over here. So anyways, this, this whole dual duality was cooked up by somebody named Juan Malvasena. So you'll sometimes hear this gauge gravity duality term. If you ever hear that, that's, that's this whole Maldacena conjecture. Anyways, they did these calculations for these supersymmetric Yang-Mills, N equals 4, supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory, um, using this gauge gravity duality, and they found that they, the ent when they calculated the entropy over, sorry, the, the, the viscosity over entropy, they got exactly 1 over 4 pi, which was an extremely low value, and so um, KSS these guys, Kovchin, Son, and Starnitz, made a conjecture that you could actually not get anything lower than this uh, particular value, 1 over 4 pi. Now, this is just a conjecture. But there's some 
um, hints that perhaps it's actually very difficult to go beyond, be below 1 over 4 pi. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Anyways, so if you take this uh, conjecture, KSS bound, this, con this conjecture or hypothesis, uh, then you can sort of compare what you see in these heavy ion collisions with this value of eta over s. So if you take eta over s equals to zero, you get this plot here for v2 versus the transverse momentum. If you do uh, eta over s is equal to 1 over 4 pi right at the bound, you get a pretty good description of the data. If you do it for the LHC, you also get a pretty good description here of the data for eta over s is equal to 1 over 4 pi. So that got a lot of excitement. If you look in the literature, you'll see lots and lots of papers on, on this whole uh, gauge, uh, this, this, uh, this entropy over this, uh, sorry, viscosity over entropy bound, um, and the uh, connection to the heavy ion collisions. Now, there have also been um, studies uh, looking at this in, in cold atoms, ultra cold atoms. So here is uh, the work of uh, John Thomas's group when he was at Duke. Um, here is uh, a, a lithium six in a, in a, in a, in a in, 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 a, in a trap. Okay, basically it's a harmonic oscillator, a three-dimensional harmonic oscillator trap, a uh, harmonic trap where, where you elongate it in one direction and you shorten it in the other. So it's like a cigar, if you want, shape. And what they did was, so uh, they, they, they had this, this gas, you can see it at different times, and then they just let it, they let it go. They, they released it from the trap and watch how it expand. It was very much like what you see with the lipid flow for the heavy ion collisions, you see that there's more pressure, uh, more, a, a greater pressure gradient across um, this direction, and so as a result, you see the expansion goes along this direction, along the, this, this direction here, just like in heavy ion collisions. So, and one can also measure the uh, uh, the viscosity over entropy ratio, uh, entropy density for this case, and make a connection to heavy ions as well as make a connection to this this gauge gra gravity or the string theory uh, duality. Oh, by the way, I should have mentioned, this is very often called the ADS-CFT uh, duality or ADS-CFT. ADS stands for anti-de-sitter space. Anti-de-sitter space. It's a, it's a type of a cosmology or a, a certain boundary condition, if you want, for the universe. Um, and uh, CFT stands for conformal theory conformal field theory. So when you hear the terms ADS CFT, that's what they're talking about, this whole duality that I just talked to you about. Okay, so now you can plot what uh, eta over S is, the viscosity over entropy density, times the one over the purported lower bound, for pi, and you can see how it compares with the limit here, which would be one, okay, eight over s equals one over four pi, and for ultra cold atoms you get pretty low, but you you get maybe uh, like a factor of five times the, the the bound. For helium you're about a factor of ten above. For for water you're a factor of maybe about thirty above. For but for the quark gluon plasma it seems like you get very close to the bound, maybe even possibly going a little bit below the bound. Who knows? There's a lot of error bars. Okay, and so um, that's quite interesting. So they very often say the quark gluon plasma is making the perfect liquid. It's getting to the lowest possible viscosity that's allowed by quantum mechanics, if you believe this band. Now, this viscosity also does other things if you look on an event by event basis. So the, um, you can think about these heavy ion collisions as, um, as having some what are called quantum fluctuation. So if you want, you can think of just as collapsing the wave function. You, you try to figure out where all the particles are um, in some quantum wave function, but because the quantum wave function is probabilistic, you only, get, you only can say what the probabilities are. But once you've identified where all the particles are, then you can do a classical flow of the particles. And so you would see different sort of initial conditions in terms of collapsing of the wave function, uh, depending on where where, where things are, and also the, the shapes of the nuclei. Okay, so anyways, here are the initial conditions. Now you can then start from some, some time t equals to zero, and then you can evolve with no viscosity or with some viscosity, okay? And you can then try to look to see what you, 
C for the particle distribution at the end. And so you do that, and you, what you find is that there's, you know, if you have low vis or zero viscosity, you, you have lots of structures to them, lots of um, um, higher harmonics, they, they call them. These higher harmonics meaning um, no more than just an elliptic flow. So elliptic flow is, there's a difference between the horizontal versus vertical, but you can have then higher azimuthal har harmonics. Okay, you can have the, the, the one, v two, v three, v four. All right, that would just be proportional to phi or cosine of two phi or three phi or four phi. Now then, but if you have viscosity, you would expect then some dampening of these um, inhomogeneities coming from, from, well, as you might expect a lot of viscosity to do. So then you can take a look to see whether you can see these um, V2s for the elliptic or these triax, uh, the, these triangular flows or this quadrangular flows, V4, V3, and V4. And you can see here that V2, you get a nice signal. You see some signal for V3. You get some signal for V4 as a function of PT, the transverse momentum. All right, so, so just to wrap up then today's lecture, Barons and mesons form from independently flowing quarks, and then quarks that you can find for a brief moment, and then you have hadronization. So you have this sort of hierarchical picture where in the beginning you have this quark bone plasma, where you have this almost perfect liquid with as low viscosity as possible with elliptic flow um, in, at the quark level, and then as you get more and more dilute, then you have hadronization, and then you just have the shower of particles coming out.